Good uh, evening from Belgium, I should say again, because it's evening here. Good afternoon to you all. Uh, I'm honored to be chairing the plenary session that will discuss uh, some, some, I should say, of the coming futures of refugee and migration law. This seen from a judge's point of view. It will be a pleasure to hear from all the distinguished judges from different continents that are here on the panel. All of them are more than accomplished, you'll hear that. They have in the past contributed to the judicial dialogue within the RMJ. They have all been involved in professional development of their colleagues in a national and international setting, and they have reached out to scholars and lawyers as well. So I'm very honored to have my colleagues on the panel. It is hard to foresee the future of refugee and migration law on one hand, because we don't know how the political and economical situation in the world will, will change. But when we talk about utopia, as the conference is doing, it would be a world without refugees, of course. And only those migrants that go to another country because of interesting job possibilities and family reasons, personal reasons, and not because they have to leave, because they have no jobs in their country or because the economic situation in their country or region seems hopeless. However, we know that that future will not come true. Uh, we know this now, but we didn't know this, I think, 30 years ago. Government still thought that it would turn out okay and that the movements of people in the, you know, in the 60s, 70s and 80s would, would come to a stop. But of course, we know much better now. So that future will not be utopia for sure. But then again, we all, what we can do as judges, well, you'll hear from my colleagues what they do and what they foresee to do. And I think that's, that's what we can add to a better world in a sense. What we can add to try to communicate to, with another, one another and try to make uh, the situation or at least the judicial side of migration and asylum a little bit better by being better judges by talking to one another and by continuing our professional developments for ourselves and for our colleagues. But I will not take up too many minutes because you want to hear from my first speaker is Bastian Zalar. He's, uh, he is uh, my, my, page, my page. He's a president of the RMJ Europe. Not that I needed a page for that, Bastian, I'm sorry. <laughs> He's also a senior high court judge in, uh, at the administrative court of Slovenia. He's an ad hoc judge of the uh, court of just of the human rights court in Europe. He's also a professor at the University of Ljubljana. And he will talk about a dynamic uh, situation in well, in Europe for the moment, the political field a little bit, he said. Uh, so it will be very interesting to hear. Bostian has been, I mean, I'm, all of the bios that you will hear from me today are just really very, very short. All these, these people have pages to tell you, but you don't want to hear the bios, you want to hear the people speaking. So Bostian, I'll give you the floor. Uh, thank you, Kathleen, and good afternoon and good morning. Well, I, I see two famous philosophers behind the title Utopias as practices. But before mentioning them, let me say, uh, while speaking about refugee and migration law in Europe through provocative lenses of utopia and coming futures, that we must be careful. European asylum and migration law is very extensive, very detailed, and certainly very real. The first big wave of EU legislation on asylum and returns were adopted between 2000. The second wave came in 2013, not to mention the relevant case law of the Strasbourg Court, which started back in 1989. And of course, 
There are also national legislations aiming to transpose the European legal sources into daily practice. Furthermore, as mentioned by Kathleen, a lot of professional development activities is going on since the first wave of EU law on asylum. For example, in 2017, the European chapter of the International Association of Refugee and Migration Charges started a huge project with the EU institution, the European Asylum Support Office, in order to develop common training materials for judges of the member states, consisting of judicial analysis, which are sort of comprehensive commentaries of EU law in conjunction with the case law of the Strasbourg Court, accompanied by the judicial trainer guidance notes. These training materials for judges altogether have more than 2,000 pages and are available for free. So in this sense, it would be wrong to talk about utopia. If there is any aspect of utopia to talk about, it is only because, because we jointly failed to effectively implement in full the existing European law and standards in our daily jurisprudence. In this respect, I need to point out the problem of bad transposition of the existing rules on access to asylum procedure, because bilateral agreements signed by the member states of the European Union, also with the third countries, are often used as a bypass to the regulation of the common European asylum system. For example, at the moment, there are pending cases before the Strasbourg Court on issues related to pushback policies at our borders against at least 10 European states. Despite the fact that in some countries, national courts did react to illegal pushbacks, for example, in Poland, Italy, France, Slovenia, Serbia. Therefore, the unsatisfactory level of transposition of the European Union law in certain areas of refugee protection can be related to the crisis of the rule of law to the bad management or mismanagement of quality of services provided by administrative authorities and courts. We experienced also a lack of political will in mechanisms within the EU institutions to enact, to enact the rule of law. But this week, the Vice President of the Court of Justice of the European Union confirmed the obligation imposed to Poland to pay a periodic penalty payment of 1 million euro per day because the Polish government did not comply with the interim measure ordered by the Court of Justice of the European Union, which was necessary in order to avoid serious and irreparable harm to the legal order of the European Union, that is to the values of the rule of law and judicial independence. Such act of European judiciary is not a reflection of utopia, but rather an act of utopia as practice. Nevertheless, instead of putting more incentives and funds on establishing sophisticated national systems of quality management of decision-making processes and adjudication at the level of the member states, the European Union is already moving towards a new, the third wave of EU regulatory framework in the field of asylum and migration. I will not say much about migration since uh, in this area, the European Union will focus on the so-called talent partnerships with third countries to attract highly skilled workers that are needed in different labor markets and to strengthen the rights of residents to move and work in different member states and to simplify the procedures for low and medium skilled workers. Thus, I will rather shortly address the issue of future of refugee law, which is much more problematic. As I mentioned, in September 2020, a new pact on migration and asylum has been adopted. The pact sets which regulations and directives tend to be adopted in the near future by the European Union. For this occasion, I will briefly follow the money in order to identify where the futures of European refugee law go. Namely, this new pact is accompanied with a multi-annual financial framework till 2027. It is somehow clear that the financial means and the legislative proposal 
proposals go into direction, broadly speaking, of the so-called external dimension of refugee law. These are all kinds of border procedures, border and coast guard management, return of illegally staying non-EU nationals. A significant amount of money will be given for financing with third countries in order to reduce migration flows and enhance return and readmission. The aim of the EU funding is to address three pressing challenges. First, solidarity and cost sharing between the EU and its member states, for example, relocations of asylum seekers and refugees. Secondly, EU funds tend to address the challenge of flexibility in order to respond to emergencies. And third challenge is a coherence of the external and internal dimension. Here, I see a strong moral dilemma, which actually should not be a dilemma at all. Fight against irregular migration and border management and cooperation with third countries should not contradict the rights of refugees to access to asylum procedure, as this is one of the basic legal premise of the internal dimension of EU law on asylum. This is crucial because power is legitimate as long as it is exercised in accordance with the values that are proclaimed to be the foundation of the given society. Professor Liz Goldner Lang from University of Zagreb recently presented analysis of three major legal proposals from the new pact from the perspective of funding that is envisaged for these three proposals. Her analysis showed that finding to, uh, funding uh, to cover costs for relocation might be sufficient, but there are serious doubts that funds will be sufficient for the additional tasks in relation to screening procedures and border procedures. And this will particularly be relevant for frontline countries, such as Italy, Greece, Spain, Malta, and Cyprus. Thus, it seems that the concept of famous Slovenian philosopher Slavoj Žižek comes into play when we discuss new pact on migration and asylum. Slavoj Žižek already back in 2004 spoke about utopia as a practice. He said, we must dare to enact the impossible. We should rediscover how to not just imagine, but how to enact utopia. For him, the future will be utopian or there will be none. Well, as a judge, I'm not so sure that this will work and I certainly cannot speculate whether this third wave of legislation framework will be in fact adopted and enacted or not, and whether it will be uh, financially feasible or not. But what I do know for sure is that I find my refuge not in Zizek's perhaps useful provocations on enacting utopia, but rather in the French philosophical tradition of enlightenment. For this occasion, I picked up Voltaire in his novel Candide ou l'Optimisme. In Voltaire's concluding words against exaggerated optimism that we are, that we are living in the best of possible words, he says, il faut cultiver notre jardin. We do cultivate our garden in the European chapter of the International Association of Refugee and Migration Judges, together with our numerous partners from civil society and EU institutions. And our garden is the rule of law in asylum and migration disputes. And we will continue to do that. After concluding and updating all fundamental chapters on very sophisticated legal issues on material and procedural refugee law in the aforementioned professional development series, we will most likely in the future focus to the challenging issue of access to procedures at the borders. It might be the case that our garden expanded during the era of the so-called alternative facts so that we judges must go out from our classical intellectual isolation more often in order to help that credible words, thoughts, arguments, reliable facts and constructive exchange of views 
will find their way back to the meaningful public discourse. In the meantime, I hope and predict that the development will continue to grow towards the system where EU agency on asylum will get the competence to decide asylum cases at the first instance and that we will have a specialized EU court on asylum as the second independent instance. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Bastian. Yes, well, that would be an utopia in, 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 uh, in Europe for sure. <laughs> but we can only strive. Let's see what Catherine uh, Kutsupulu has to add to this um, from her point of view from Greece. And, and Catherine uh, Kutsupulu is an administrative judge since 2010 and she sits at the first instance uh, court in Athens in Greece. She's also a member of the Asylum Appeals Committee since 2016 in Greece. She's currently the vice president of the International Association for Refugee Migration uh, judges, the RMJ, but globally. She is an experienced trainer and has conducted training for the European uh, Asylum Office, for the European Judicial Network and national institutions. And she has also participated in drafting, coordinating and reviewing the professional development series that Bostian was earlier talking about. Bostian also did that. So, um, so, you know, that's a little bit of more information. So, Catherine, I will immediately give the floor to you, please. Thank you. I will try to share my screen and I hope I can make it. Okay. Perfect. So, um, do you see my screen now? Yes, yes, it's, it's, okay, it's okay, yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> after Bosian, um, I will try to speak about um, the utopia I feel is IMJ. So I feel the need to describe a little bit of our association for uh, um, our participants today. Uh, now, the International Association of Refugee Law Judges is our utopia because it was formed back in 1997 uh, and had the aim to basically bring all refugee law judges together so that they can come to a common understanding and uh, interpretation of international refugee law. In March 2019, Due to uh, the current reality of the mixed nature of cross-border matters coming before judges, it was decided that the objectives of the association should be changed in order to also include migration law issues. The name was also changed to IRMJ, International Association of Refugee and Migration Law Judges. Now, IMJ is comprised of four chapters, Americas, African, Asia Pacific, and the European. And there are also eight working parties comprised of uh, a number of transnational groups of refugee and migration law judges who are working on a number of critical issues in international refugee and migration law with the objective to try to examine divergences and differences in judicial understanding, and basically to point out best practices. Our conference papers, our reports, guidelines of the RMJ working parties are frequently published in leading refugee law and migration law journals. And also uh, we um, issue quarterly global newsletters where updates of our chapter's activities, recent case law of interest from around the world, and a selection of in-depth reports covering topics of interest are hosted. And over the years, IMJ has gained international recognition, as evident by its numerous collaborations with worldwide stakeholders, such as UNCHR, the European Commission, the African Union, the European Asylum Support Office, the International Organization of Migration. 
and why it is a utopia for us. Because judges from all around the world come together, discuss, exchange ideas, exchange their views, share their, pro their problems. And at the end, they find solutions. But most important, we're having fun. We are friends. We enjoy being in this association. So now I will come to an unpleasant reality. Unfortunately, as Bosian described, things are not good and we cannot discuss about utopia right now. The COVID-19 pandemic uh, has disrupted all facets of life. Asylum too. Data shows that arrivals of new refugees and asylum seekers were sharply down in most regions. This reflects how uh, restrictions, um, how many of those seeking uh, international protection due to these restrictions in 2020 and 2021 became stranded. But despite these restrictions, displacement continue to occur and to grow. Despite also the pleas from international community for a ceasefire. And as a result, UNCHR points out that above 1% of the world's population, one in 95 people is now forcibly displaced. And now, now uh, there's an ongoing crisis around the world. Perhaps one of the most complex and fastest growing regional crises worldwide is the one in Africa, in the Sahel region of Africa, where almost three quarters of a million are newly displaced. And there are also gross violations of human rights in northern Mozambique, in Ethiopia, where more than 55,000 people fled in 2021. There's also Afghanistan, Somalia, Yemen, that continue to be displacement hotspots. The Syrian conflict stretched into its 10th year, and there's been an outbreak of hostilities near Europe between Armenia and Azerbaijan. As Bostian said, Europe has many battles to give right now. Uh, in Europe, we have maintained an ad hoc, crisis-driven response, leaving a few members bearing most of the pressure. There are also right now alarming reports of systematic violations of human rights at EU borders, especially in Greece, where the authorities are accused of pushing back all the refugees at the Aegean Islands. The European asylum system remains undermined due to significant dif differences in recognition rates across EU countries. For example, in 2020, the recognition rate of Afghan citizens at first instance ranged from 2% in Hungary to 93% in Italy. This is an obvious failure of the system. There's also an ongoing failure to share responsibility in Europe since the relocation sims had collapsed. Recently, in May 2021, 2,000 people arrived in Italy in an island called Lampedusa just in 24 hours. And the commissioner urged member states to show solidarity and support with relocation. Ten days later, it was only Ireland, the first, the only country to have answered, offering to take from this 2,000 people only 10. As Bosnian said, right now EU bodies and member states continue discussing about this new EU pact on migration and asylum that promises to establish a coherent, a comprehensive approach, a European utopia in asylum. But despite the situation in asylum, we have other problems too in Europe. There are increasing challenges to judicial independence, 
in several member states. And Poland, as Bosian said, uh, the highest court there ruled that some parts of EU treaties are incompatible with the Polish constitution and also underlined that it has a right to check the rulings of the Court of Justice of the European Union. Basically, the pillar of European integration is being challenged right now in Europe. I understand that I have to make a guess about the common features of refugee and migration law, but it will just be a guess because no one can predict the future, especially when it comes to politicians and asylum. I guess that continued instability around the world uh, suggests that the refugees uh, in the world will grow, the number of refugees in the world will grow. I also believe that it would be a utopia if the discussion could in the future can't be concentrated on those fleeing life-threatening climate change. Because we discuss about climate change uh, and we forget that there are people who suffer from this uh, climate change. The states will eventually have to decide whether they will apply an effective approach to asylum. An approach that looks holistically at the experience of displacement, and the extent of the individual's protection needs. And from life-saving aid at the moment of crisis to community support for building a new life. I hope more steps will be taken toward socioeconomic integration. The discussion in the future, I guess they will also focus on creating more legal pathways to seek protection because this is the only way to fight trafficking. In Europe, we have a very, very big task. We must avoid the, avert the emergence of new dividing lines in our continent. And the member states must work towards effective solutions to migration and refugee related challenges. I guess that at the end, Europe will establish a truly comprehensive, coordinated, regional approach that is rights-based and people-centered. And yes, I do believe that in the future, we will be able to live in our own uh, utopia. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Now we will uh, leave Europe for a little bit and go to Africa. And uh, our next speaker is uh, Justice Dunstan Malambo. He's the Judge President of the Gauteng Division of the High Court of South Africa since 2012. He's also a council mem member of the World Body of the, Internet of the RMJ. He has been the President of the Africa, or he is the President of the Af uh, Africa chapter uh, since two 2020. And he has taken part in the refugee and migration law training programs for the benefit of other judges, especially in Southern Africa, but also around the world. And as I say again, if you want a big CV, you can look at the profiles of the people because all, all the judges have a lot more than what I'm just saying right now. So please, Denson, could you take the floor? You're muted, you're muted. Dunstan, you are muted. Thank you, yes. sorry about that. Uh, I don't know what happened there, but uh, good, good, good evening from South Africa, uh, wherever you are. I know that Martin is already on Saturday morning, but uh, be that as it may. Thanks for this opportunity uh, to present what's happening in this beautiful continent uh, of Africa. I think I need to acknowledge that when I looked at the theme of this conference, the coming futures of international refugee and migration law, it said to me that it is challenging us to adopt a forward looking attitude in the context of asylum seekers principally, 
but for decision makers as well. Because when we talk of utopias, safe heavens, we need to find ways of resolving the issues that currently confront us as decision makers or judges, as well as that confront largely asylum seekers. And uh, I must acknowledge that in our context as judges, dealing with refugee law matters, we play a pivotal role in ensuring that legal systems designed to protect refugees and asylum seekers, so to speak, or displaced persons who are vulnerable, that those systems are compliant with the principles that we find in international and regional instruments, as well as in domestic legislation in the implementation of or upholding of refugee protection. In my view, to achieve this could ensure some form of utopia, as I say in my book, but that's for us as judges to make sure that refugee protection is upheld. In this talk, I just want to talk about what we are doing in the African chapter in relation to what we are, we are doing to create utopias as well as fashion what the future holds for the chapter and its members. I agree with Boschen as confirmed by Catherine that it's difficult to predict the future, but I hold a very firm view that we can influence the future in the roles we play in the field of asylum seeker. I also acknowledge that COVID-19 has affected drastically a lot of asylum seek processing systems in many countries. And this has resulted in a complete shutdown. And this situation continues in large parts where the processing of applications has virtually come to a standstill. In my country, South Africa, they have now opened online applications uh, for, uh, for, 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 refugee, for asylum seekers and uh, in-person meetings are allowed only per appointment. But I'm sure we all must acknowledge that this is not ideal if one takes account of the personal circumstances of asylum seekers in general. So talking about utopias, one has in mind fully operational and efficient systems that ensure fairness for asylum seekers. And that's the other goal for the chapter, in addition to the goals that looks after us as members and as members of the judiciary. I also acknowledge that we have emerging hotspots in the continent. Catherine has mentioned the Sahel region, northern Mozambique, Somalia, but we also have Ethiopia, where there's this conflict with the Tigray peoples. But these hotspots only galvanize us to find solutions and ensure that efficient processing of asylum seeker applications, as well as humane circumstances where asylum seekers can retake their lives are created. So with that introduction, let me share with you a number of developments on the chapter fronts that we have taken and uh, which with, with the objective of introducing efficiencies in our activities and in our, in our countries. We've taken key resolutions. I think we took them from the end of last year. The first one, which is very important, is we recognize that when we come together during chapter conferences, a large part of the continent is not present, and that's French-speaking and Portuguese-speaking Africa. So we've taken a key resolution to say we need to regionalize the chapter in ensuring that we have regions where the activities continue. This is meant to encourage closer engagement. We want to follow the African Union organizational footprint in having five regions, but we want to make sure that language becomes a key gateway towards this. And we want to specially focus on French and Portuguese speaking countries, because as I said, they've been very absent in chapter activities. Because of this particular problem, the French and Portuguese language issue, we want to create, uh, in addition to the Southern region, which is English speaking, the East African and uh, Horn of Africa region, which is also English speaking, as well as uh, North Africa, which is French speaking, but uh, 
Mostly we find a lot of judges who speak English there, as well as English speaking West Africa. We also want to create a French speaking uh, Central Africa um, region where all the activities of the chapter will also take center stage. We have also taken a strong resolution that we need to strengthen our cooperative relationships. Recently, I was invited to the Southern African Chief Justices Forum as president of the Africa chapter to talk to them, the Chief Justices of about nine regions about a cooperative arrangement with the association to make sure that we have inroads into their jurisdictions to make sure that we advance chapter um, objectives insofar as asylum related issues are, are, are concerned. The other key resolution we've taken relates to our conclusion of a tripartite memorandum of understanding with the Judicial Institute for Africa, as well as the UNHCR, which is based on three main objectives. One, and the, that is the key, is the training of judicial officers on refugee and migration law. In this regard, we have established a center of excellence for English speaking countries. We are also in the process of finalizing uh, discussions regarding the creation of a French speaking center of excellence. I know that uh, in the North, North Africa, the discussions are quite advanced in creating a North Africa center of excellence, which will be Arabic based. So that's the first one. It will be focused mainly on training. And uh, next month, our first ever training program starts with a four, day, a four day training program. And a number of countries have already shown interest in that training program. The other resolution is to create a system where, which dedicates itself to collating asylum related jurisprudence and uh, using the African LIB platform. You will all acknowledge that most of the time, the jurisprudence that we are exposed to is European, as well as American, Canadian, and I think in Martin's end of the world. As far as what's happening in Africa, it's been very quiet. And yet we know that there are key decisions that are taken uh, that we need to know of, particularly as chapter members in this continent. So we think this will strengthen membership and will ensure that we look forward to learning what's happening in other regions. And the other main objective of this MOU is the establishment of a dedicated chapter website to enhance membership linkages, as well as enhance engagements throughout the continent that ensure that uh, we remain in touch wherever we are with what the chapter is doing. These resolutions take into account our current reality and are aimed seriously at revamping our programs to bring in solely required uh, efficiencies. If we achieve this, I think we would have created some form of utopia. There are two other key developments that I just want to talk about. That's on the jurisprudential front. Um, one is we've had a decision that's about three weeks or four weeks old that was given by our appeal court in Bloemfontein. That judgment was covered by Martin in our most recent uh, uh, newsletter, where our appeal court provided critical guidance on the correct approach by uh, refugee status determination officers, as well as our refugee appeal board and the high courts, that is the high courts using their review jurisdiction, particularly to the test of well-founded fear of persecution that we found in section three and its relationship to section three B, the, the test there of external aggression, occupation, foreign domination, or events seriously disturbing or disrupting public order. You will re immediately recognize that the Section 3B uh, test comes out of the OAU 1969 convention, but both these tests have been domesticated in our Refugees Act. And the appeal court provided guidance that these two tests need not be looked at in isolation. And it also provided guidance that persecution as found in Section 3A needs to be 
looked at expansively. So it is to be welcomed that we have our courts that remain active and talk about the key issues that courts continue to grapple with uh, in their own backyards. So in recognition of the separation of powers, uh, the appeal court, instead of deciding that matter itself, despite reversing what all the previous entities did, including the high court, it simply referred the matter back for fresh appraisal by the RSDO. To me, that shows that we as courts should also remain vigilant to not straying beyond our terrain and respect uh, the separation of powers principle, because that's what creates unnecessary tension between us and the executive. The second case that I just want to mention um, before I finalize my talk is a case that's currently playing out in the Houghton courts. It involves some 250,000 Zimbabweans who hold exemption permits. These permits expire after 10 years and allow um, citizens of Zimbabwe to work in South Africa. Because of the imminent expiry of these permits, these permit holders approached our Home Affairs Department to have them renewed and the Home Affairs Department refused to renew these permits. And this refusal means that all these uh, persons have to return to Zimbabwe and most of them are here on those permits because they've got jobs and they've only known South Africa as the only home in the past 10 years. So what they've done is they've launched proceedings in the, in the High Court to review the refusal of uh, their applications to renew their permits, but they've gone further. They've said they want the court to actually force the Department of Home Affairs to grant them permanent resident status and issue them with South African ID documents. So the jury remains out. But my view of these two cases is that they strongly affirm that we as the judiciary can still shape utopias for asylum seekers, but can also ensure that our jurisprudential platform uh, remains cohesive and provides necessary guidance when we sit and deal with matters uh, that come before us. So I just thought, let me touch on those key resolutions and those key developments in this continent, just to give you a best eye view of the activities of the chapter and which we think are in sync with the theme of this conference that we can shape future uh, utopias and we can shape uh, future efficient processing systems in this, uh, in this continent, which translates into utopias, so to speak, for the judiciary and for asylum seekers. Let me end my talk there. Thank you very much, Katalina. Thank you very much, Dunstan. That was very interesting and hopeful. And so I said that it's, it's, it's really, really nice to see how much effort is willing uh, or judges are willing to put in trying to, 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 to make a, bit, uh, a better world. Maybe we'll have some questions later. Let me now first go on to another continent, to Americas. And um, we'll have Judge Lemus, who will uh, now take the floor. He is um, an academic, a lawyer, a specialist in human rights and international humanitarian law. He is a judge of the Costa Rica Administrative Tribunal of Immigration already 10 years now and a member of the RMJ since 2007. And he is the president of the Americas chapter of the RMJ. Um, Esteban, please, can you take the floor? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, on behalf of the American chapter, we appreciate the invitation to this important event. I am speaking to you from Costa Rica, a small country, but with a great migration tradition, a country that believes in utopias, like when in 1949, we decided to eliminate our army, and 73 years later, we live in peace and without fear. When we talk about migration and refugee, we also talk about utopias. People migrate for many reasons. No money 
migrates for a single reason, but fundamentally they migrate because they have no future. Hope for a better future does not know fear, do not know borders, and does not need a passport. Let's review the reality of our continent. Thousands of people are leaving their homes in Latin America, the Caribbean and other regions in an effort to secure futures that have become practically impossible in their countries of origin. Economic dispossession, lack of access to education, health and employment, violence, maras, and other structural and personal factors have motivated people from all over the world, but mostly from Central American countries, Venezuela and the Caribbean to seek a new life in the United States, Canada, or other countries within the region. Many with, will have the, uh, successfully gone through a visa application process uh, to start a new phase of their lives, but some won't be so lucky. We have 6 million Venezuela migrants and refugees globally. At this moment, when we are speaking, hundreds of people are crossing the Darien jungle between Panama and Colombia to begin the route to the north of our continent. South Americans, Caribbeans and extra regional migrants make the crossing in extremely vulnerable condition and are exposed to risks along their migratory route to the north of the continent. This is not just a Latin American issue. The Mexican border police have reported last week an increase in arrests of, of people from Asia and Africa, including Bangladesh, Senegal, Ghana, Uzbekistan, India, and Nepal. Before getting to Mexico, in this route from the south of, of America, crossing Central America and getting to Mexico, before getting there, there migrants often pass through South American countries as Ecuador, Chile, Argentina, Brazil, or Bolivia, as same as Costa Rica or Mexico, where they work for months or even years. People who migrate to North part of America must face long distances across dangerous river and desert crossings and using unsafe forms of transportation to reach their destinations, such as trains, the top of the trains, this special train in Mexico called the, the Beast, uh, or inside overcrowded trucks. They may also be exposed to different from, forms of violence, including being robbed, extorted, assaulted, trafficked, and even killed. The true number of people who have died while transiting through the region is, no, not, is not known, but records compiled by IOM, Missing Migrants Project, reflects that around 5,000 people have lost their lives in the last four years in the Central and Northern American region. So why do people who migrate decide to risk everything, including their own, their own lives? Migration is not just an economic issue. It's also a human issue. Beyond, beyond, the, beyond the national interests that we may have around the issue of migration, we are dealing with the dreams and the, and the illusions of people who, because of their destiny, were born on one side of a world. 
the information that the people receive from their families and friends in the United States and Canada, plus what they see on social networks and television about the possibilities and lifestyle means for many of them an utopia to redefine their own lives. More than walls and patrolled borders, more than strict laws and controls, the only thing that motivates migration to the north of our continent is prosperity and the creation of opportunities. The motivation of a better life will always be for them the best utopia. From the American chapter of our association, we try to have virtual conferences to understand migration and refugee from different points of view. We have tried to incorporate more judges from Latin America to see different visions and to exchange better practices of jurisprudence and international law. Last year, before the COVID pandemic, we have the World Conference of Judges in Costa Rica, and we hope to have our regional conference next year. Recently, COVID has forced us to make exchanges of best ways to apply the law in times of pandemic, a new thing for all of us, such as the application of virtuality as we are now having this conference. We are sharing with our colleagues the jurisprudence and best practices of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, the reports of the Commission of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, as well as the regional reports of UNACR and IOM that are so necessary in our daily work. I want to, to end with, with this phrase from one of the most um, one of the most important writers from South America, from Uruguay. Utopia is one is is, an, is in the horizon. I move to a step closer. It moves to a step further away. I walk another 10 steps and the horizon runs 10 steps further away. As much as I may walk, I never reach it. So what's the point of the utopia? The point is this, to keep walking. So this is the utopia of our chapter association. Continue walking in better legal practices for migrants and refugee and, and asylum seekers, and seekers and better application of international law. That's our utopia. Thank you so much, Catherine. You are unmuted, Catherine. <laughs> Kathleen, you are unmuted. Oh, I saw, I'm sorry. I was saying that this was a very nice quote to end with and we'll all remember it because it's so very true. It's keep on going. That's, that's what the RMJ is doing as well in Latin America, in, in Africa, in, and in, the, in Europe. And we go back to Europe now with the next uh, speaker, which is Judith Gleason. She has been for a very long time, since 2095, and 2000, we are not there yet, that's a very future, 1995, um, a member of the, of the um, and being a migration law judge, and then in the upper tribunal since 2010 in, uh, in London. She reads jurisprudence at the Lady Margaret Hall College in Oxford and was a, a Weiner Unspec Scholar on the Diploma in Civil and Community Law at the, Univers at the Université Libre de Bruxelles before qualifying as a solicitor at the Supreme Court. 
In March 2020, she was honored to, to be appointed a fellow at the McLaughlin, sorry for the pronunciation, college in the York University in Toronto. She has always been very interested in international and comparative law, and she has been a member of the RMJ for a very long time. And now she's leading one of the working parties on human rights nexus in and uh, in international protection and migration. Yes, Judith is also one of those long mem long standing members who are active as a judge in the RMJ. So from the UK, Judith, please, can you take the floor? Right, I'm going to try and share my screen. Here we go. Uh, that's the one I think. Did that work? Yes, yes, good. Yes, yes, yes. that's that's fine, that's fine. <laughs> all right, just checking. It's all very technical. Well, now, this is, our species is a species that migrates. That's a given. If we weren't a migratory species, we'd all still be living with mitochondrial Eve down in the Horn of Africa. Why do we migrate? We migrate for hope, we migrate for a better future. We migrate sometimes because we're scared, but it is a species that's always moving. And the idea of utopia goes back at least two and a half thousand years. The first description that I've been able to find was in Plato's Republic, a harmonious cooperation of all the citizens and a reliable philosopher king willing to lead a simple life. And then you've got St. Thomas More, a rebel, who took on Henry VIII and lost. In his utopia, which is the first time the word was used, it means nowhere in Greek. Have I got that right, Catherine? Utopia? Something mm, like that. Something. something like that. It's a fictional island society in the South Atlantic Ocean off the coast of South America in the Platonic tradition, but also commenting, using it as a way of commenting on the repressive regime in Henry VIII's England, under which he lived and unfortunately died. Then in 1866, we get Victor Hugo saying, there is nothing like a dream to create the future. Utopia today, flesh and blood tomorrow. And here in England, William Morris in News From Nowhere, describing a flight from the city of London to a simpler agrarian life. And he said, the material surroundings of my life should be pleasant, generous, and beautiful. That I know is a large claim, but this I will say about it, that if it cannot be satisfied, if every civilized community cannot provide such surroundings for all its members, I do not want the world to go on. I think we need to think about that when we start to think about climate. And long ago, 1946, the UN recognized that the problem of refugees and displaced persons was immediately urgent. You have to distinguish between genuine refugees and displaced persons and war criminals, quislings and traitors, wonderful phrase, who don't get protection. But the problem is international in scope and nature. And back here in Europe on 9th May 1950, the French foreign minister, Schuman, he said, world peace cannot be safeguarded without the making of creative efforts proportionate to the dangers which threaten it. Utopia is a very important fundamental human concept. And we now work, all of us judges, with a whole lot of common international instruments. We've talked about the Refugee Convention and the various regional instruments, which take the definition a little further. There's the UN Convention on Human Rights, the UN Convention Against Torture, the African Charter. There's the Bangalore Principles to guide us on how to behave and the global compacts on asylum and migration. And then, as we've been saying, there is the International Association of Refugee and Migration Judges, which is something of a utopia of its own, I suggest. It was formed round about the same time the internet got going in 1995 in London by a group of 51 judges. It's expanded now to five or 600 judges around the world four regional chapters, Africa, the Americas, Asia Pacific and Europe, and you've heard what they're doing. Until 2016, we only dealt with asylum, but 2015 to 2016, we had the big migration wave in Europe 
And in the 2017 World Conference, we expanded our remit to include migration, as Catherine was telling you earlier. And we have judge-led working parties, which get together to study and provide best practice guidance on aspects of refugee and now migration law. And that's what I want to talk about a bit. These working parties draw together a small group of international judges, hopefully sitting across all four chapters for common discussion, reflection and professional development, and to provide a source of learning and benchmarking for all asylum and migration judges globally. And in Europe, we've also contributed to the forming of training materials for the European Asylum Support Office. And there is a core set of absolutely wonderful training materials which came out of the RMJ. The working parties who just reviewed their guidelines provide a forum for discussion and analysis, not just for fellow judges, but also for others involved in the refugee and migration law process through small transnational groups of judges. They're active between the major conferences as well as at the regional chapter and world conferences. And they publish guidelines or opinions on matters within their subject area, which are available for not just judges, but also lawyers internationally to guide international bodies of judges in this and in their fields of law. So in the past, we've covered an awful lot of topics. This is really just a selection. We've looked and we are still looking at how asylum procedures are working around the world, where the bottlenecks are, whether the procedures are fair, who is disadvantaged by the procedures, whether there is too much detention, all of that. We've studied, though we're not currently studying, we have studied the African asylum systems, and you will have been as interested as I was by the breadth of the vision that the African chapter has of what their judges need and how to support them and how to ensure that everybody is part of the discussion. There are two handbooks, the Credo handbooks produced, which give detailed guidance on how to assess credibility, which is the most important thing in many asylum determinations. We've studied country of origin information and country guidance and produced guidelines on that. We've studied disability and displacement. 10 years ago in the Human Rights Nexus Working Group, we were looking at deserters and conscientious objectors. The world has moved on rather from that. We're always looking at statelessness. We've looked at subsidiary protection and we've looked at vulnerable persons. The current working parties are looking at artificial intelligence. I told you that we ran current with the internet. Artificial intelligence, whether we like it or not, is the future. But the question is how the judiciary retains human control and retains humanity in the decision making process. And I'm really looking forward to the guidance that will come out of that group. We're still looking at asylum procedures. They've grown progressively more full of obstacles, more hostile. The amount of time that you get while you're waiting is less. Whether you can be joined by your family members has been diminishing over time. When I looked at the Asylum Procedures Working Party a, a few years ago, you discover that in Denmark, for example, you can only take a certain amount of money in if you're claiming asylum and the rest they will keep. In Hungary, they'll keep you standing outside the border with no food or water and only process 100 people a day. I don't know whether that's got better, but I suspect it hasn't. In Sweden, they are checking the trains on the way from Germany coming in checking passports, trying to stop people coming in to claim. And then, of course, as Catherine was saying, we have the problem with people arriving in boats, which is affecting my country too now, which it is quite appalling that people should be prepared to risk drowning themselves and their family, chasing the utopia that is the countries of refuge as opposed to the countries they've left. The streets are not paved with gold, but certainly many of our migrants think they are and have been told they are. 
And then we have deportation, we have, we have exclusion, cessation and deprivation. We have judicial resilience and well-being. This is a new theme, but a very important theme. The pressures that judges work under these days, we have to remember to look after ourselves. We have to remember to keep well. A particular social group is always an issue. And it's the place where the Refugee Convention has expanded to protect groups which were not obvious to the drafters of the Convention back in the late 1940s and early 1950s when they were looking at a particular set of problems, a particular localized movement within the continent of Europe and a particular set of recent issues. There are all sorts of groups that are protected now that the drafters of the convention would have thought didn't come within what they were trying to do. And I think it is very important that it has that flexibility. I saw a lecture by James Hathaway recently, and he was asked to look at how the refugee convention was holding up because of course it's, it's 70 years old this year. And he said, you know, for 70 years old, the old girl's holding up quite well. And I think he's, he's right about that, but it's partly because of the flexibility that a particular social group introduced into it, which is just one line uh, by the suite in the traffic preparatoire. And finally, we're looking at vulnerable persons. Now that carries different meanings in different countries. In my country, it's about adjusting the hearing so that traumatized or young or old or otherwise ill people get a fair hearing. In Greece, as I understand it, you can get to the mainland and get your case dealt with on the mainland if you can show you are a vulnerable person who shouldn't be on the islands. That's an entirely different sort of vulnerability to be looking at. It's an entirely different focus of being a vulnerable person. It's extraordinary looking at how all of this fits together like an enormous three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle with all the problems all around the world and nowhere else really has this global worldview that, that the IRMJ provides. So what next? Future issues, coming futures, unfreezing the world. When we pressed pause back in March last year, there were lots of people in the wrong country, some of them on holiday, some of them overstaying, some of them there on visas which have since run out. When the world starts to move again, that's going to need a fair amount of sorting out. And some of them will have had babies and some of them will have new relationships. And some of them will have been excluded from their home country, their country of passport, their country of origin because that country has slammed the borders shut. New Zealand has done that, I know. Australia has 30,000 people in India who can't get home. All of that is going to create all sorts of new problems. Statelessness is going to be a major problem. Some people will have been born in circumstances which mean that they can't acquire the nationality of one or other parent or both parents. But in Asia Pacific, statelessness is about islands going under the sea and the place you want to be a citizen of just simply no longer being there. And then climate refugees, which we talked about a few minutes ago. At the moment, I don't think any of the regional instruments and certainly not the original refugee convention stretch far enough to protect people who move simply for climate reasons. But we are going to have to keep looking at that because there's going to be more and more people migrating because their land is, is not any more livable in or because there's been some climate related disaster. Let's hope the old girl can stretch far enough to cover some of that too. So that's a very rapid overview of where the working parties fit into the IRMJ and the judicial utopia, which is this wonderful international conversation that we've been having since the mid nineties over a larger and larger group of judges in more and more places in the world. Thank you very much for your attention. 
Thank you very much, Judith. That was an interesting overview of a very important part of the work also within the RNJ, the working parties. And our last speaker is a judge from the other side of the world, from New Zealand, Martin Treadwell. He's a chair of the New Zealand Immigration and Protection Tribunal, which hears protection and migration appeals. He is also the president of the, uh, uh, the Asia Pacific chapter of the IMJ, and he is also, he has another hat still, he's the secretary of the IMJ global body. So he has many hats, and having all those hats, he continues to do the training on top of that in many uh, region, countries across the Asia Pacific re uh, region, and he's always everywhere when we have world conferences as well. So Martin is a very busy person. I will leave you the floor, Martin, please. Hey, thank you, Catalina. Uh, just bear with me while I try to share my screen. If I, if I was kind to you all, I would just sit here for 10 minutes and let you look at the utopia of the Isle of Pines off the coast of New Caledonia, uh, which is my personal uh, utopia in the Pacific. But I think uh, I'd like to pick up where Judith left off, which was talking about this conversation that we've been having since the mid 90s as as refugee and migration judges around the world. And really, in many respects, the, 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 the starting point for that, um, if I can get this to work, is to remind ourselves uh, of what it is that the, the IARMJ uh, sets out to do. Uh, and it's easily found in our constitution. Uh, we recognize that judges have a special role in determining issues involving refugee status, complementary protection, and rights and obligations arising from issues of migration law. In this role, they are axiomatically required to consider core principles of the international rule of law, including international human rights law and practice, international humanitarian law, and the concepts of human dignity and human security. Uh, and across Asia, these concepts of human dignity and human security are very much to the fore in, in terms of uh, concepts of, of refugee status and, and protection. Uh, and really, it's fair to say that to try to achieve these ends, the, the IARMJ directs itself to the pursuit of the promotion of judicial independence, the professional development of judges and in international law as it relates to refugee and migration law, support for judges in their ongoing work, uh, and providing a forum for the sharing and exchange of information. And, and this is Judith's point, uh, relevant to international law as it concerns refugee and migration law. There are, however, in the Asia Pacific region, uh, some rather special challenges. Um, uh, and the first of these is the tyranny of distance. Uh, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in a second. Um, we also have the problem of a paucity of signatory states to the Refugee Convention. Uh, and we share with most other regions, um, uh, and I think in particular here of, of the challenge for Dunstan uh, in terms of aligning Anglo-Africa, Francophone Africa, and Arabic-speaking Africa uh, into one coherent and cohesive chapter. Across Asia Pacific, we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of languages. The, the tiny Pacific Island nation of Vanuatu itself has over 80 languages. Uh, and so this is, this is a, a significant challenge. Um, and there is no historical commonality uh, between, for example, many Asian languages and English, um, whereas Romance languages provide some assistance uh, in, in, in Europe with, with, with understanding cross-language issues. 
that that that's simply not the case in in, in Asia Pacific. And lastly, we have uh, our fair share of territorial and, and regional tensions. But just to go back to that first point about the tyranny of distance, so that you understand what it is that we're grappling with, think about the Asia Pacific region in this way. If you went from the western edge of Asia Pacific to the eastern edge of Asia Pacific, actually it's it is quicker to go the other way around the world. Asia Pacific stretches more than halfway around the world. And even that distance is over 18,000 kilometers. So the distances for us are, are quite staggering and there is not the the ease of travel that there is around Europe. There, there are um, vast areas which cannot be accessed by land um, and air travel is really the only feasible um, means of transport. The second challenge that I talked about was the paucity of state signatories. And from Western Asia to Southeast Asia, there are in fact only 11 signatories to the Refugee Convention. Uh, and those are the countries. Um, the, 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 the Stan countries that came out of the former Soviet Union have been uh, remarkably proactive in becoming signatories. But beyond them, you can see that there is um, an enormous void of, of um, compliance in the Middle East and in Central Asia and in Southeast Asia. And indeed, um, in that region of Southeast Asia, Cambodia is the only signatory and, and the uh, status of, of um, uh, refugee status determination there is rather fragile. So this is, this is a significant challenge for us. Uh, before leaving that, I should add, it, it, it doesn't require statistics to appreciate from the graphic here, um, the extent to which those regions are themselves refugee producing. But despite uh, the distances and, the, and, the, and these challenges, the Asia Pacific chapter has in the past decade uh, provided training to judges and decision makers in uh, 14 jurisdictions in, in our region. And in the years before that, there were a number of others, but uh, in terms of, of, of the modern era, um, uh, we have been working with 14 countries in particular, and I'll come to those individually in a second. But I just want to acknowledge first the, the, the incredible support we have had um, in the last decade from uh, bodies such as UNHCR, APRON, which is the Asia Pacific Refugee Rights uh, Network, um, uh, uh, and also ANRIP, the Asia, Asian Network for Refugee and International Protection. These, are, these last two are, are self-funded NGOs that have been incredibly proactive in countries, particularly in Southeast Asia. Uh, and through their auspices, we have been able to get access to, for example, judges in Indonesia and in Nepal. Um, we have, as I say, we've also provided training in places like South Africa, Moldova and Russia. And I could add Mongolia to that, to that list as well. But if you look across our region, we have in the last 10 years provided training for judges in Nepal, uh, Indonesia, Hong Kong, Taiwan, South Korea, Japan, the Philippines, Palau, Papua New Guinea, uh, Vanuatu, uh, Samoa, also Fiji, Samoa, Australia, and New Zealand. Uh, and that in itself should give you some picture of, of, the, of the challenges in um, uh, providing training and professional development. The, the, the cost involved is, is truly significant. Um, 
it, it it's ironic that it has taken something um, of the gravity of COVID to make us all comfortable and familiar with video technology so that we can not only have a conference like this, but I can sit in my office in New Zealand and I, and I can talk to a bunch of judges in Nepal. In terms of future positive trajectories for refugee and migration law in Asia Pacific, uh, I think of this as my wish list rather than uh, anything that I that I have confidence we will be able to achieve. And like Catalina, I love Esteban's um, ex explanation of the, the point of utopia as being constantly moving towards it, because I think that is absolutely right. I think, first of all, uh, we need a greater recognition of the involuntary migrant hub that is the, the, the role played by many Southeast Asian countries. Um, they are a, 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 a funnel through which uh, refugees and irregular migrants try to reach safe haven, uh, and many, many of them get stuck there and live lives um, that, that, that are undocumented and, and deeply unsafe. Um, and the IARMJ will continue to uh, reinforce and support regional judges in protecting human rights for undocumented and irregular migrants in that, in that region. We need proactive and not reactive responses to the climate crisis, which is looming, I think it's closer than the horizon, to be honest, for low-lying and otherwise vulnerable island nations. Uh, and of course, um, for Asia Pacific, the, the, two, the two great blemishes are on, on human rights in our region uh, are the Rohingya uh, and the uh, current crisis in Afghanistan. Uh, 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 and it, it is incumbent on all of us uh, as judges to um, not only support respect for human rights in those regions, but also to support the judges uh, who are grappling uh, in countries like Bangladesh and, and Afghanistan to uphold human rights. And that is it from me. And I think if I am the last speaker, Catalina, I'll hand it back to you. Yes, thank you very much, Martin. It's very interesting to see what's happening in the Asia Pacific region as well. We all went a little bit beyond our time and we have perhaps time for one question. Uh, or uh, if I don't see any questions for the moment, I do not see any hands raised. Do I, can I, if somebody wants, Sorry, Caitlin, I, people have to ask the questions in the Q&A oh, okay. chat box. And they did not. Okay, then we must have been very clear in what we explained. But you're going to shut us off uh, in, in a minute or so, probably in a couple of minutes. So I think that uh, hearing all the panelists and explaining what is happening in their part of the world and in their area of the world, it is clear that we know that judges have a special role in national societies, but that the judges of the RMJ do really take up this role. And I think that's, that's it, it is really nice to see because it is, as I said, it is not so simple. Being a judge is a very hard job and it's more than a, a nine to five job, well, maybe a, a double time job. And still those people put heart and soul in trying to, to help uh, not only the refugees and asylum seekers, but also the law and the, the, the migration law, asylum law forward. And this is important, if I may conclude with that, is because asylum and migration law is not only strictly, strictly about asylum and migration, it's about humanitarian law, it's about procedure law, which can then also affect other parts of our uh, national legislation and national law and the way the judges look at that. I firmly believe if you're a good judge in one part of your uh, um, 
legislation, you're a good ju a judge in all of it because you understand and you grasp that what you are supposed to be doing. And so even if some of the judges from the RNJ move on to other tribunals, other courts, start doing, I don't know, in, you know, civil law, other parts of civil law or criminal law, I think the knowledge what they have gained through asylum and migration law will carry with them to the other parts of the law. And yesterday, I know that uh, I saw that um, Mr. Rikov is also on uh, listening to us now, and I'm sure he will agree with me uh, when I say that criminal law and exclusion in asylum, you know, carry the same weight. And so it's uh, it's 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 very important, I think, that what uh, each of us is trying to do. Uh, what Esteban's um, uh, Esteban's quote was uh, uh, is so is really it's it's very opportunate. We need to continue to walk, and that asks every day an effort to do so. And I think uh, that is one of the great things of the people from the RNJ that they're willing to do so. I think they're going to cut us off soon, but if anybody still wants to say something uh, for the next minute or so, please. Anybody else wants to say, conclude anything, say anything? No questions yet? No? <laughs> there, there is one question. Um, okay, I cannot follow. see it. Following Esteban's suggestion that utopia is what is done, how do the IARMJ efforts translate into the daily work of judges? Perhaps as I have only one, does anybody want to answer that? Or should I answer it? I'll just I'll just answer because we have a little time. I think every day, what the RLJ does is is extending our knowledge, extending what we are supposed to understand by asylum law and migration law uh, about you know, when Judith Gleason was gi uh, giving you a, a, a list of the working parties. These are just some of the topics that we have to deal with in our daily work. So the obligation almost for all judges in any kind of uh, field of law is to continue to study continue to, 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 to learn more and to have a better understanding of what could be done in their field of law. And that is what we do. And that reflects immediately and directly in the work in the courts. When we learn about uh, how to deal with, with uh, why do I say procedure law or, or any other type of law, when it, it takes, you know, it, it takes courage sometimes for a judge to do the right thing. And you can say judges need to follow the law. Yes, of course we do. We are not, we don't make laws, but it takes courage to do the right thing. And I think, and within a society like the IMJ, when you can talk to your colleagues and say, how do you do that in your country? I have that particular problem. How do you fix that? And you feel supported to do this to do the right thing, then of course this affects immediately the work you do. Not only the way you think, not only the way you act, but also the outcome, of course, and that is the most important thing for the people who appear in front of you. So yes, whatever we do within the RMJ is immediately and directly um, put into practice in courts all around the world.